Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Mark Beal. I'm the CTO at Intrinsics. We are a uh, SOC design services firm, and um, we do work for, uh, as you can see, some uh, government folks, uh, IoT ap applications, and uh, uh, many others. It turns out that um, Linton mentioned a few programs that uh, DARPA's got some RISC-V activity in. Well, uh, the DARPA CHIPS program is another one, and that's one that we're uh, executing in. And what I'm going to talk about is some uh, Intrinsics IP, previously existing IP, that was selected to be used in this program. And that's about all I'll say about what's happening inside the program. Uh, the reason we have a RISC-V in our system is basically uh, focused on the ability to deliver integrated hardware software uh, silicon IP. So uh, Intrinsics has this uh, uh, secure execution environment. It's a, I'll talk about the details in a minute. Uh, and what we've done is extend it so that we can deliver not just the uh, crypto engines and the other security uh, IP that's part of this, but we can actually deliver a complete API all in the, uh, in, in the ROM and in the embedded uh, software that's there by bringing in a RISC-V. So what's in here, it's, it's basically uh, uh, for DOD and IoT applications. Uh, I don't think it's uh, Linton's, uh, you know, turn the crypto all the way to the, to the right for, for, you know, so, sort of severe DOD applications, but for certain DOD applications, it's a good fit. And it's really came from the IoT world. Um, so it has the secure execution environment, crypto accelerators, it's a root of trust with uh, TRNG, uh, and it's really there to do the NSA Suite B crypto and the other kinds of things you would want to do, uh, TLS, uh, secure tunnels, over-the-air firmware updates. And this is meant to be a drop-in into a larger SOC, as you'll see. Uh, so just to be clear, uh, this talk is not about the uh, security extensions. Um, it's not about the trusted execution environment uh, that we didn't get to hear about today, but I'm looking forward to hear about soon. Um, and although it actually uses rocket ship in the bigger SOC, it's not about that either. It's actually about just how to leverage RISC-V to deliver uh, the integrated hardware software silicon IP. And uh, our example of that is this uh, uh, crypto subsystem that we deliver to SOC projects. So what you see here um, on, the, uh, on my left, anyway, is a uh, cartoon of a simple uh, a a SOC. Uh, in this case, it's uh, built with a rocket corplex, some fabric, uh, other things, uh, and what we're going to focus on is the security subsystem here. So we're talking about a big SOC, we're talking about the security subsystem that you see, um, and in particular, we're going to talk about the uh, RISC-V processor uh, that's in there. So just to give an overview, uh, it can, this consists of uh, specific accelerators that create the uh, crypto subsystem. Um, we uh, don't add any uh, crypto extensions to the processor itself. It's very small, as you'll see. So this has an AES engine, SHA engine, elliptic curve accelerator. Uh, the secure fabric is kind of fundamental to our approach, which I'll talk about. Um, and then it includes uh, all the software that would go into a uh, typical IoT application, um, the secure boot, the over-the-air updates, and um, various things in the uh, crypto stack, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so the purpose of the uh, processor in this is really acting as a traffic cop. It's a very small processor. Um, all the accelerator engines can operate in parallel. So you can do AES at the same time as SHA, at the same time as uh, the elliptic curve for secure, for secure boot, for example. Um, and uh, all of this happens in, in you know, very high speed. Uh, all, the, all the accelerators are, program, are uh, parameterizable for you know, very tiny IoT or, or very high bandwidth. Um, so the, uh, before having a RISC-V in our system, uh, our model for delivery, we've had this uh, security IP for a number of years. It's in a number of uh, silicon implementations now, today, anywhere from 28 nanometer all the way, all the way back. Um, our, our particular approach uh, prior to the last uh, sort of year or so was that we would just provide that collection of accelerators that you saw kind of interconnected to over the secure fabric. Uh, but it would be up to the customer, our customer, uh, to kind of integrate the register accesses and the low-level software. And um, typically, that would run on whatever the host processor was in the SOC. Um, and uh, that was workable, but it was actually very expensive to do the integration. It was ne not necessarily reliable, and it wasn't necessarily verifiable in terms of all the cryptog cryptographic properties and the security properties um, 
that you would want to have in a system like this. So partly for convenience and being able to deliver uh, a prepackaged software wrapper around the IP, and also partly for uh, correctness and, uh, uh, and, and resistance to side channel uh, uh, attacks, we decided that the best thing to do would be just add this small processor in, deliver all the software as part of it, and expose an API that the higher, uh, the larger processor would call. So, um, so as it says here, the alternative uh, was to have the main processor or another processor uh, control all the security activity, um, but the benefits of including a separate RISC-V um, are, of course, the isolated execution environment, the security software is locked down, and we have some very well understood partitioning of how the security software uh, will work in this situation. Uh, secrets, like key material, for example, uh, are never held in any of the registers in the main CPU, um, so there's no possibility for uh, user code to interact with that. Um, uh, and of course, we can then pre-verify the hardware software interaction that is so critical to uh, both the correctness and the side channel resistance. Um, and you'll see how we separate the secure and non-secure actions uh, when we drop this in. And the cost of doing this, it's really just about uh, way, way under 1%. We're just using the tiniest little uh, RISC-V RISC processor, 20K gates, 25K gates, depending on some details. Um, so it seemed like a good trade-off uh, to do it this way. So the security processor implementation is very simple. It's just a two-stage uh, uh, RV32i plus C. Um, the interesting thing you might not expect is, though, that we do require machine and user mode uh, for this, uh, the way we've set this up. Um, the way it works is the local ROM that is shown uh, all the way uh, on the lower, uh, on your lower left, um, is uh, where the initial boot code is, and all the sensitive security primitives are there. So any code that is going to access the uh, any registers in any of the accelerators where uh, key material needs to go, uh, any kind of secret uh, can only be accessed by code being fetched from the hard ROM, and that is basically you know bare, uh, metal ROM. Um, then we also have an instruction RAM that is basically loaded at boot time with. Uh, code that's signed by the uh, code that's in the ROM, and basically it's then locked down, and it's fetch only, and uh, nothing else can get in there. Um, and so basically, the way we've got this set up is that if you're in machine mode, you can fetch from the ROM. If you're in user mode, you can fetch from the instruction RAM, uh, only uh, from the instruction RAM. And then we maintain this partitioning very clearly. So the idea is that once you're in, as long as you're in machine mode, you basically are hardwired with literally, you know, down to the transistors, down to the metal in the ROM, and there's no software that's been loaded that can ever execute in machine mode. So the way this partitioning is, is working is that the rocket is, in this case, is the primary CPU. So that's the processor you would think about. It runs the OS. It could be Linux. It could be an IoT OS like Zephyr or uh, Minute or something like that. Uh, we'll talk about Zephyr in a second. Um, and of course, the OS itself and the applications are all authenticated by uh, the code running in uh, machine mode um, at the beginning at, at secure boot. Um, the security in uh, the, the, the security RV32, the small processor I just talked about, when it's in user mode, basically is running the higher level protocol. So something like TLS, something like the full ECDSA. Uh, something, uh, well, that's actually not a good example, but something like uh, the, the, the uh, ECDH. Uh, um, various uh, higher level protocols are running in user mode, in, and that means that they can be fetching out of that RAM that we had in there. Um, and, and all the code it runs in user mode has been signed by the uh, code that runs out of the, uh, out of the ROM. Okay? And there's no secret material that's available uh, to, the, to code running in user mode the way we have this set up. And then finally, in machine mode, the RV32 uh, only executes from the hardwired ROM. That's the only place it can fetch. It's, it's, it's locked down uh, in, the, in the RTL. Um, of course, its job is to do the secure boot, authenticate all the higher level firmware for, for, the, uh, for the other two uh, modes, um, and handle all the secret material. So the reason for this partitioning is uh, a couple, a couple points. One is that it becomes very easy to sort of understand where secrets are, where they are not, 
look at, look at uh, uh, w where things are running. Um, and uh, we're actually looking to do actually formal verification, uh, hopefully, of, of this um, small uh, machine to do this. Uh, but secondly, this also reflects um, some realities of the supply chain for semiconductors. So the machine mode code is basically part of the IP. It's hardwired. Intrinsics delivers that. The, the code that's in the uh, uh, user mode is actually would be like the semiconductor company that is sending this chip out into the world would have its code there. And then the actual user's code, someone who buys this chip and put it in the system, would use the primary CPU. Um, so just as a quick example, um, take the Zephyr OS. Um, how we would basically be uh, partitioning that so that the, um, the, the, the uh, let's say it's a, a smaller rocket with, that, with no MME that, that's running Zephyr. Um, Zephyr uses a, uh, a crypto stack called TinyCrypt. So basically what we do is we just, we just create an API, uh, 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 an API that matches the, the uh, pub, uh, open source TinyCrypt. Um, all the high level protocols that are in TinyCrypt run in, secure, in the uh, user mode here, okay? Um, but then when it actually comes time for you know, uh, key access or loading up a block or running something through, um, basically there's, a, there's a, a, a call over to lower, a lower level API that runs in machine mode. Um, these activities that are happening in machine mode are typically working on pretty large blocks, so the fact that you have to do a, you know, a call and, and change the privilege uh, is you know, a, a few cycles over the course of many, 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 many thousand cycles. Um, so by doing this, we have this clean partitioning, and uh, it it's allows us to uh, kind of verify correctness and, and security properties. And it also provides an API that, that people are used to that, just, that they can just drop into their uh, systems. Two more things is that uh, this is also able to be, the small processor can be used as an always-on processor, uh, controlling uh, certain features there. And for very, very tiny IoT devices, the application code um, can actually be included in the authenticated user mode firmware, um, which to eliminate the big CPU for very, very, very tiny IoT devices. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you for listening, and I will be available for questions.